Now, I'm going to just be honest with you, man. Y'all, I don't know if y'all saw me over here. I'm screaming bloody murder, man. Because there comes a point in every Christian's life where you realize <coughs> that, first off, Shannon said this uh, Wednesday night when we had the regroup over here with him, uh, that the, the dirtier you are, the greater you see God. Because when you're in the dirt, man, and he pulls you out, you see just how good God can be. I don't know about y'all, but I was in the dirt. I, I mean, I'm talking about way, way down there. And, um, and, and so, and, and the, the funny thing is, even knowing the Lord, when we get dirty again, we realize how good he is that he continues to take us back, you know. And, and there has to be a moment in every Christian's life where we realize he does love us. There is that thing called love that he has brought to us. And it supersedes all the things that we've done wrong. It supersedes our idea of this, this guy with a switch in his hand. I don't, I don't know how y'all raised, but bless God, I got a couple of hickory sticks, and I had to go get them. And that whole way back to the house, you're thinking, if this ain't thick enough, they're going to make go get another one. <laughs> you know, but God's not like that. Now, Paul's very clear over in Hebrews that God disciplines those he loves. Uh, but in that process, love overcomes all the discipline. And I think that's something we need to learn today. So when we talk about this thing today as... This, and we're talking about impacting the world for the, by embracing the heart of God, okay? We want to embrace the heart of God. When we talk about that, we have to understand that the heart of God has never been against us. It is against what sin has done in us. Now, you need to understand that today. He is not against you. He is against your sin. And the sin that you have in you is what holds you back from being what God wants you to be. And we have to clarify that it is not you that God is against. It's what has happened to you through sin. In that same thought process, we need to come to terms with, God is not against them. So a church that says God hates this, and hates that, and hates this, he hates the sin, he does not hate the sin. Somebody better say amen. And we've got to get that in our mind. We've got to get that mindset going on that he is not against people. He is against what sin has done to them and the sin that is in their life that is holding them back. So when we talk about this morning, the first, the first thing I want to share with you is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he sacrificed his son. Now, the, the, first, the verse after that clarifies love even more. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through Him. So He came to save us from the garbage that is taking us away from Him. Now, when we get that in our mind and we realize that's the same way He feels about them out there, the world is a whole different place, a whole different thing happening. People are not our enemies. Now, I'm going to talk about enemies in here in just a minute. But we are not the enemies of God because we are people. We're the enemies of God because we have sin in us. Y'all understand that? Sin creates that adversity. And we have got to get beyond sin to love people. All right? Now, I want, I want to make sure y'all understand today that what we're trying to do is show how to get a hold of the heart of God. Okay? So the first point, write this down, is we can impact the world when we love the way God loves. Now, when I read that verse, John 3, 16, so many people use that in evangelism. For God's the love of the world. For God's the... Now, Shannon, what I want to ask you to do is, is talk to them a little bit. Now, Shannon and I are going to go back and forth on some things today, and, um, and we're going to share with you some. But uh, I want him to kind of, does that verse speak of evangelism? If it does, evangelism is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, that the kingdom has come through Christ, and that he is here to save us, Okay. If that is evangelism, why is it or why is it? Talk, talk to me a little bit. What does that mean? Well, I think we have to understand that that verse is, is just specifically love. As yep. a matter of fact, we characterize John 3.16 as the love verse because it is the first. It is the time where we actually see why was Jesus sent. Well, it was because he loved the world. Right. And I think when we take evangelism, it, we have, well, evangelism is defined, that's what I wrote down as a spreading of the gospel by public preaching or personal witness. Right. The problem with that is, is that we have, um, sorry, we no. have 
polluted that in so many ways because when we take evangelism, we think that we, we think of things, places like Oktoberfest or some type of big public venue where you've got a bunch of people out there with signs that say things like, I hate gays or, or yeah. you, know, you know, whatever derogatory remark that they have. And what we've forgotten is evangelism is a tool. That's all it is. Yep. Uh, we have to understand the method that we're trying to do, come across. And in this verse, what we understand is the method is love. Yep. We have to love people. How we go about telling people about Jesus or, or, or proclaiming the gospel is, is different. Mm -hmm. there, there's several different ways. But if I don't have love in my heart, if I don't recognize that God loved me first, that's good. Because let me tell you something. I'm, I'm, you ask my wife, I'm the most unlovable person in the world sometimes. <laughs> And, and, and some of you men, you know, you know this is exactly the same. Your wives are like, amen. <laughs> but the truth is, <laughs> Carolyn's laughing and she knows. <laughs> you better straighten up more. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> Caught you. <laughs> but I love this quote that Andy, say, Andy Stanley says. When, he says, it's always easier to make a point than it is to make a difference. That's good. That's really and, good. And so I think the motive always has to precede the method. And the motive for us is because God loved me, I want to, not that I have to, I want to love this person because we all recognize, you know, it's not just husbands. We're all unlovable, okay? Yeah. Um, you know, I was just thinking this morning, listening to those songs, you know, yes, I know God loves me, and he loves me in spite of myself. Yeah. And that's what I can't, that's, that's the, the most graceful, most amazing thing that I can think about when we sing that song is that, man, he loves me in spite of my my shortcomings and my weaknesses and my failures, he loves me. And yeah. because he loves me, he loved the world, and he gave his son Jesus for that. You see, love, actually, the word love here means to cherish or take pleasure in something or some, somebody. Now, here, here's where we have an issue. How many of us cherish people out there? <laughs> Man, how many of us, I mean, take pleasure in people out there all the time? We don't, even take, we don't even cherish each other and take pleasure in each other. The, the church is the world's worst place when it comes to loving one another. Let's get real. I mean, so many churches have missed that opportunity. So when we talk about cherishing other people, I'm going to be honest with you. There, there's a, a, a very big, big um, spot in us that is empty of that because we have not allowed God to fill that up. And it takes God filling it up. It, the, John Ortberg said this, the story of the Bible is not primarily about the desire of people to find God, but God's desire to be with people. So it's about God wanting to be with us, not about us wanting to be with him. He came to get us. Even when we didn't know we needed to be God, he came to get us. Um, and, and when Jesus talked about fishing for men, it's because men didn't realize they were hungry for it unless we start fishing and start casting the line. You cast a line into somebody's life. Listen, man, if they're, if they're going through hell in a handbag, they're going through divorce, if they're going through struggles and trials, man, you cast a line and tell them you're going to pray, there's a bunch of them that will grab onto that for a minute. And you can reel that in if you have love because they want someone to understand and take them to that next place. Um, here's what Deuteronomy says. For God, the, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great and almighty, the awesome God, who is not partial nor takes bribes, which means he loves everybody. Okay? But then he says this, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, the alien, therefore you will, uh, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. Sojourners are people who are without God. They're people who are on a journey but don't know where they're going. They're out in the middle, they're outcasts. And, and this is saying that God wants to bring them in. Uh, and then he tells us this. He tells us in James, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enemy intimate with God? And then it says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We were enemies before we were saved. And we need to remind ourselves of that. Somebody say amen. amen. You need to remember where you were. You were not God's friend because sin had clouded all that. But then he saved you and made you his friend. Now, here's what I want Shannon to do. Listen, man, talk to him about 2 Corinthians and talk to him about the reconciliation and love toward others through that passage over there. Uh, well, let, me, let me go back to one thing go ahead, real quick go ahead, go ahead. in regards to, to this fact about love is we have also belittled or polluted love, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, we say, we say all the time, I love you, man. Yeah. 
or I love you. Yeah. Or, you know, it's just like it, it, we, it's, it's in the same line of prayer. I'm praying for you. And, <laughs> and we're like, are you really? Yeah. Do you really? Do you, you really, really love me? Do that? And uh, I, heard this, I heard this pastor say one time that we've got to take that love and we've got to totally change it. And he, he said it like this. He said, we've we got to make love. Yeah, that's good. A verb. Because if we don't make love a verb, then it's always going to be this watered-down sensation of yep. well, what is it actually. Yep. And that's just putting forth the, the effort into regards to how we're going to love people that's exactly in the right. future. Because love is an action. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but love is an action. That's good. Go ahead. So, talk about Second Corinthians. so when we talk about Second Corinthians, uh, let's just go ahead and read it. Can we, yeah, can throw it up on the screen for you. Uh, it says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what are we is to known what are we is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Yeah, that's good. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for the sake died and was raised. Yeah, and from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone, in, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who is through Christ reconciled to us into himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, who is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, before you say something, let me say this. I want to go back to verse 19. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, I want you all to read this next line with me. Listen, listen to this. Not counting their trespasses against them, so how dare we do? God doesn't count the trespasses against them. How can we say we can? How can we hold up signs that say we hate gays when God doesn't hold that against them anymore? Y'all hearing what I'm saying? How can we be the belligerent people that we say we're not, but we act like we are if God has not, if he's not counting trespasses anymore through Jesus coming to save us, then we don't have the right to do that either. So we cannot hold them to the same standard. Somebody would say amen. All right, go ahead. Talk to me. So ultimately what this is saying is this is a total mind shift for all of us. That's right. Okay? Because before this love came into our lives and we understood what love is, you look and you can say you can say all you want. I looked at somebody. I know, I don't look anybody any different. No, you do look at somebody different. Uh, because this is just who you are. This is who we are by nature. But it is, as love is entered into our lives and love's come into our lives, it's impossible for me to look at you the same That's as right. I used to before right. I was a new creation. That's right. So now when I go to a restaurant, all right, and you're standing in line for hours at a time, and you've got this waitress who has, is just miserable, and she's miserable, and she's mad, you have to look at her like, well, she's terrible. No, you have to look at her. This is, this is one of God's creations. Right. This is a person that God created and that God loved, and I need to give her as much grace as I possibly can. Uh, if I'm driving down the road and there's a person that's, that's slow, you know, hold on now. Some of you are already getting convicted. <laughs> <laughs> you're driving down the road and, you're, you're, and they're slow. Instead of you going by and telling them they're, they're number one, mm -hmm. <laughs> you pray for them. Why? Because that person right there, I don't know what they're dealing with. Every person that we come in contact with, that is a person that has been given to me by God to reconcile them yep, to right. him because yep. I was reconciled. That's right. And that's ultimately this whole different mind shift when the Holy Spirit that now lives within me has totally changed me. Totally changed me. I am a what? New creation. That's right. All the old things are gone. Behold, all the, old, all the things are new. And, and reconciliation means to bring peace between <coughs> two people, which means my role is to make sure Shannon has a relationship with God that has no, no fighting. No warring anymore. That he can look at God and there can be a peace between him and peace between me and him as brothers. So if I can do that, then I've accomplished something big in this world. As an ambassador, I had the opportunity to represent not me and church. Listen to me. It is not about you. It is about what God is doing through you. 
And until we get that down, we're going to have a hard time because we tend to believe everything's about us. It is not. I've done two weddings in the past week, and everybody thinks it's about them. It's not about them. It's about the bride and the groom. Somebody say amen. Do we always like it? No, but God is on the throne. He is the head of he is the groom of the church. It is about him. And so we've got to make it. We have to get out of the way so that we can be true ambassadors. An ambassador never says anything on their behalf. It's always on behalf of the one they represent. Boy, that will mess us up bad. Because <laughs> I've left a whole bunch of stuff behind that never represented God. It represented me. And I'm in the way of that. Somebody say amen. All right, what are some tangible ways that we as a people can fall in love with God, man? Talk to me. This is going to be good. <laughs> So this is, this is that part where you was like. I'm like, yeah, baby. So, Put the rubber to the road, baby. So this is really where I kind of I kind of make people get cross-eyed because again, this is a total <laughs> this is a total identity change for all of us in this room. Yep. Uh, because you when you um, I'm talking about ambassadors, right? Yep. So when we talk about ambassadors, who, what is an ambassador? Well, you think about an ambassador being someone who speaks for someone. That's right. So if we have an ambassador who lives, who's overseas, they are an ambassador for the United States. So they are speaking on behalf of the president in the United States of America. Right. Well, as we are ambassadors for Christ, we are speaking on behalf of Christ. All right? So just bear with me here for a second. <laughs> so what this means is, is if you are an ambassador for Christ, everything that you once thought was normal is no longer normal. That's right. Okay? And what I mean by that is, your job, ready for this, is not your job. Mm -hmm. All right, Your identity is totally changed. And so whatever God is, is whoever God is, this is what Zach was talking about this morning, whoever God is and what he does helps you identify who you are right. and what you do. Right. All right? So if, you know, you're no longer going to be identified as, and I, and I use Jake as an example because he was next to me yesterday, is, you know, Jake works for... Uh, a cable company, uh, he's no longer Jake the Cable Guy. That's right. He is Jake who is loved by God, who is loved through Jesus, and it's his responsibility to love others because Jesus loved him. That's right. And when you, uh, your job is not your job. Yep. You're actually a missionary. You are an ambassador. So everywhere you go, you are speaking on behalf of, of Christ. And you're like, well, well, you know, Jesus don't sign my paychecks. Oh, yeah, he does. Everything you have, everything you own comes from the Lord. Well, that messed up some people. And so what you, what you don't realize is, is this money that you get every week, that's a stopping from, the whole, from that's God exactly right. as, as a missionary to do God's work. Now, this is, this is radical. This is like one of those matrix things because if you go now to work and you're thinking, well, I've got a boss. Yeah, you do. His name's, his name's Jesus. And whatever he wants you to do, you have to do because you are an ambassador for him. That's what Paul says, do all things as under the Lord. Because right. even though you're working for somebody and their name may be on the paycheck, God's over that. God's over everybody. And he's over every, every position of authority. Y'all hear? Every position of authority is under God, Amen. which means your boss is under God. Amen. Dad. Even if he's not a godly man, he's under God and doesn't even know it. So we have to understand that the authority of my boss, whether I like him or not, He's my boss. I have to obey that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that go ahead. Go ahead. And so from that point, if when you get that mindset, and some of you are like going to go home and go, I don't know what in the world he's talking about. <laughs> and I just I pray that God just really wrecks your world with that because you are no longer your own. That's you right. not your job does not belong to you. Your paycheck don't belong to You've you. Nothing price, belongs to yes. you. Everything belongs to God. And as an ambassador for him, he's going to provide everything you possibly need as long as well, not just as long as, but because yeah. you are doing what you are called to do. Right. So in that sense, what that means is, is that where you work, where you live, work, and play. Okay? Now think about that for a second. Where you live, where you work, and where you play, you have to do a couple things. And this is where Kim was making fun of me because I love alliteration. So he, He's organization, baby. He's got it all out. Come on. And so, there, so there's four things you need to focus on. Number one is people. Okay? This is a tangible thing you can do is we, got, we all the time we go, we're going we're gonna to save the world. And I love that. I love that fire. Yeah. Uh, and that's you. That's you in a nutshell. Yeah, you we're going to take the world by storm, baby. You know, you're, you're the kind of guy is. <laughs> Let's do this. Ken's the kind of guy that's like, 
I'm going to run through hell with water pistols. Yes, baby. And I'm like, well, that's fantastic, but where's the water pistols coming from? <laughs> All right, and how? Yeah, ask Carolyn. Don't ask me you about know, the water pistols. We'll get uh, to where we're going. You know, what kind of water pistols <laughs> are we going to use? Uh, what's the step-by-step process for us to get there? And and so instead of, I love that. I love that mentality. But let's take let's let's, let's shallow it down for a little yeah, bit. So this is your. We're all new. Some of us are new to this whole mindset. Is what's eight people? What is eight people that you come in contact with every day where you live, work, and play? Where you can begin to think about and pray and, and, and reach yeah, that's good. with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just asking eight people. God's only asking for eight people for you right now. Right. There's come a point in your life where you become a mature and you'll be sent out to the world. But right now, we're just asking you for eight people in your life that you can reach for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And second thing is you need to think about these places. And we was talking, I was, this is where I was talking about, Kent, is because you, why, why is places so important? Is because some places are different than others. That's right. Okay? Now, how I speak here, this is what Paul's talking about. If I'm out of my mind, I'm out of my mind uh, for the Holy Spirit, but I'm in my mind for you. All right? So I can't, like, I was telling him, I was like, if I go to places like, you say, GameStop, yeah. and I go in here and I'm like, well, you know, here's the, you know, uh, the tribulation of, <laughs> and they're going to go, dude, get out of my store. <laughs> You know, what are you doing here? But if I go in there and I try to make and build a relationship right. in these places, if I start, like, you know, for us, and I'll use our college regroup, we have designed, we have designated a certain restaurant that we're going to meet at every week and we're going to support. Now, they may not be Christian whatsoever, but that's not my responsibility right. yet. Yep. It's my responsibility to be there, plant a seed, be an example. And that's why places are so important. So if you've you got to start thinking about these places and where you can have the largest impact. Third is you got to be able to proclaim. This is Paul P's. So this is the third one's proclaim. Okay? You better be ready to proclaim the gospel. We're not proclaiming any other message. Okay? Some of you, we have our own agendas. Yep. And our, we better set our agendas on the table, and we better recognize that God's agenda comes before my agenda, and so that's going to be the gospel. And you cannot be afraid of the gospel. That's right. Okay? You have to be willing to share it wherever it is that God has put the people around you in the places you are. And then lastly is, and this is going to be the toughest for us, I believe, is we've got to pray. And I'm not talking, I mean, not, hey, I'm going to pray for this. I mean, you better be convicted by the Holy Spirit to pray for these people and these places and these messages you're going to proclaim. Because if you don't, you're, it's, it's, it's going to fail. Yep. Okay, You've got to lead this thing with prayer. Now, none of those are in order, but those are, just four, those are just four things. But the last one, I just thought about this one, is before all those things take place, you better have some proximity with God. Yeah, that's good. You better be embracing God on a daily basis. Because if I want to be like Ken, and everybody wants to be like Ken, right? <laughs> I'm going to spend as much time as possible with him. I'm going to be. I'm going to sit at his table. I'm going to meet with him. I'm going to pray with him. If I want to, if I want to have a prayer life like Ken, I'm going to see what Ken's prayer life's like. Right. Yeah, that's good. I want to hear how he talks. Well, we all want to be like who? Jesus. Jesus, oh. right? Yep. And so, if you want to be like Jesus, then you better be with Jesus because there's going to come a point. And I love how. Peter stood before the Sanhedrin and he said, listen, it's impossible for me not to talk about these things right. because I have seen and heard them. Yep. And if you're with God and you're, with, you're, you're on a daily basis, it's going to be impossible for anybody to say or deny <coughs> you don't know what you're talking about because you have been with Jesus. And going back to prayer, which I think is so important, I think a lot of people don't know how to pray because they've never heard anybody else do it. And they have not read the way Jesus prayed in John 14 and 15. Get over there in 14 and 15, look how he prayed. Look how he got on his knees and begged God, spoke to God, asked God to bless people. Look at all those things and make that a part of your prayer life. Another thing, Paul, every, every um, book that Paul wrote in the beginning, he tells you what he prayed for. I am praying for this for you. Talk about praying for sanctification. I'm praying for a spiritual growth. I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to get all over you. I'm praying this way, this way, this We need to learn how to pray. And sometimes, parents, y'all listen to me. Your kids need to learn to pray and they listen to you do it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, man. 
some of y'all don't pray out loud and you don't think it's a big deal, your kids need to hear you imploring God to bless them and speak into them and minister to them and make them something. They, he needs to hear, they need to hear you begging God to take care of the bills because you don't want them to know how bad it is. They need to know that it's bad and God's the only one that can fix it because if it's not, they'll think you did it. And then they think they've got to. I ain't going that all day. That'll preach all day, Sunday. Oh, man. You hear what I'm saying? What I'm saying? Go ahead, Juanita. Um, my children are not here with their mom in college, but I'm they're only in class for a time in the community. They are quiet, they're peaceful. Um, so, you know, it's really important that they have an open up and open hearing because they don't know any better. Yeah. See, I've been, I've been seeing these things go around the country, I'm, and it's a sidetrack just a little bit, but I think it's important. I saw a, a, a video of a guy, who, a basketball player, who had missed a shot, an important one, and he was walking back down the court with his head up. His friend walked up and went, get your head up. Let's go. Come on, man. That <coughs> is, it matters. Your kids need to see you look and say, get your head up. You may have messed up, but we're walking forward. They need to hear you speak that way to God. They need to know that you believe God can when y'all can't. They need, to, they need to hear those things. And I'm telling you, your grandkids need to hear it. Your babies need to hear it. You need to lay hands on your children. Speak truth into them. Do you know who you are? Let me talk to you for a minute. You are the son of God. You're the daughter of God. Let's talk to him right now. Father, bless this young. Amen. Get all over. Scare, scare them. Listen to me. Scare them into the presence of Jesus. Make them aware. I'm not talking about being afraid of God, but give them a fear of God that when they walk in, they know something's going to happen. We aren't doing that with our kids. We don't, they don't have a fear of God. They don't have a, a wonder of God because we don't have it anymore. Bless God, your kids need to know that when they walk in the presence, there's a power there. Get all of that. We'll preach that all day. That's, I'm, 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 not, not, woo! Bless God. That'll get all of that. Keep going, brother. Now, I'm, but that's a tangible thing, man. It is. You want to touch lives? Pray with them. Scare the community into a fear of God. Remind them that when you pray, you believe this mess. They may not, but bless God, when it's over, they'll say, well, they know it. They believe it. Come on, man. That's what we need to be doing, all right? I, I, it's just important that we get a hold of those things because if we don't, we're going to miss the opportunities around us to show the power of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God in the salvation. Amen. It is what changes people. So we need to be a, not afraid to say that. Proclaim it boldly, man. Those are things that matter. You okay? Ooh, we preach that all day. All right. Number two, when we love people, we will impact them by blessing them. That goes along with prayer stuff. But we'll impact them by blessing them. All right, listen to these words. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob. Not you, not what you can do, not what you can accomplish, but the God of Jacob. Whose hope is in the Lord is God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is with them who keeps faith forever. Now, listen to what he says. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the soldier. He beholds, upholds the widows and the fathers. But the way of the wicked, it brings ruin. Love is action. Love is what you do it's your heart, but it comes out in action, all right? If I say I love Carolyn all day long, but I don't show it, words go nowhere. But when I begin to show that I love her, she knows I love her. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, now listen. Here we see he's executing. He is making something happen. Listen now. Giving. He is a giving God. Somebody say amen. amen. Bless God. He's, a, he op he's opening doors. He's opening eyes. He's opening ears, man. He's raising up those that are down trying to beat up. Listen, man, he's loving people. He's watching over all of us and doing great things for us. And he's relieving the hurt of the others. What's your hand got? Go, go, bro. No, go ahead. Throw it out there. Oh, you want to say, okay. I thought you were going to say something, bro. Okay. Listen, man, God is showing us that his love is meant to be active and alive, not just doing, but it is alive in the power of the Spirit. 
It is a fruit of the Spirit. When it's done through the Spirit, it's alive, man. It creates something without us meaning to sometimes. Just loving somebody can create a day for them. Yesterday I watched Donna. Donna, Donna is, a, she is a unique person, man. Uh, she's the one that directed the, the wedding. She's a, a, she's a fireball, you know. She walked up to a girl. If I had done this, I'd have been a creepy old man. But she walked up to this girl, and she looked at this girl, and she was just talking to her, and she goes, you are so beautiful. And this girl goes, well, thank you. This is wonderful. Oh, yeah, yeah. And made that girl's day. Now, if I had done that, and I even told the girl, if I had done that, I'd have been a creepy old man. She goes, no, I wouldn't take it that way. I said, yeah, well, thank God. Because everybody's talking about, well, you can't say somebody's pretty today because if you do, they think you're weird. That's God. Why? We have distorted everything in this country, man. I can't walk up and go, Ashley, man, you're gorgeous today without somebody saying, oh, man, preachers don't say that. Bless God, they do. Yeah. When you're beautiful, I need to tell you you're beautiful. Yeah. When you're in sin, I need to look at you and say you're in sin. We need to be able to do that with one another. But the reality is action turns into real truth and love comes out of that. Talk to them about what truth, how to, how to claim to know God on behalf. Listen, I want them to know how this role of ambassador fits in on this part right here. Talk about it with them. Well, can we go back to something? Go ahead, do it, man. <laughs> because I think, I, th I think this is really good. I think you're hitting a really a nail on the head here. Because for some, where, somewhere along the line, we have just become scared Christians. Yes. You know, and, yep. I, and it, it almost to the point where I'm like, I don't even want to call us, I don't even want to say Christian. We're just, we're just <laughs> we're scared. scared, you know, <laughs> uh, because, and I see, I see it in here. I see it in here a lot. You know, God puts a word on somebody and they're like, man, I'm just going to hide that right here and not say anything to anybody. And what that does, and I tell you, and this, you, you're, our, you're our youth leader as well. Yeah. You're, you're, you're leading the youth. And they what, ain't right. What, what, God, what do know. you see? You hear them say, well, I'm afraid to do this. Yep. Well, they're afraid to do that because the people in this room won't step up and do what God's called them to do in the first place. I had youth last Thursday night, not last Thursday, the Thursday before that, that told me, they're sitting right over here, some of them sitting right here, some of them over there, okay? They told me this. One of them told me I should have been down at the altar praying with my family, and I missed it. He's sitting right over here. He said, I missed it. And I said, don't ever miss that again. I had another young lady tell me, she was, I know I'm supposed to go down and pray at the altar with everybody. I know that I'm supposed to go down and lay my hands on them. My mama, and she said, my mama, she, she just got God all over, and I want to be that. And I said, then why aren't you? She goes, because I don't want them to, to think, there goes that little girl. And I said, don't you ever let the, don't let anybody despise your youth. That's what Paul told, told Peter. Don't, I mean, uh, Paul told Timothy. Don't you let anybody ever despise your youth. You do what God's called you to do. I mean, I, I was blown away. I was blown away by what these kids were telling me, man. Because I realized in that moment, God was moving on our young people. Yes. And I'm telling you, I told them, then be set free. Walk into it, bless God. Own it. Let God do something. Emma looked at me. She goes, I'm not supposed to be in front of anybody. Okay? That's all right. She's not right now. But bless God, if God is calling you to get to the altar, move your hind in down here. Don't you let anybody hold you back. Today, if he tells you to get down here, get down here. If God tells you to lift your hands to worship, raise them up high. I had a young lady tell me last week in that youth group, she said, I just don't want to sing loud enough for people to hear me. I just don't, I don't want to do that. She goes, I said, why? She goes, because I don't want to draw attention to myself. I said, nobody's going to watch you sing. They're watching Jesus, and they're up here for singing. You lift your hand up, and I promise you, it'll be up here before long. You raise your voice, and before long, you'll be screaming. Watch the old man in the corner over there, because that's what he's doing. Don't you worry about what anybody else is thinking. Church, listen to me. He's exactly right. Until you get your butt in gear, they're never going to follow us. Until we step up, they're never going to do it. If you're standing like this, that's what they're going to do. If you do this, they'll follow you. Bless God, if you get on your knees, they'll follow you. Church, somebody needs to lead something other than this man up here and this man up here. Somebody's got to be the one that says, I'm going to step out and nobody's going to hold me back. That's the kind of church we need to be. Yeah. And we cannot wait for people to 
do something. And I told them, man, you do not know how long I have prayed for a youth group that wants to do something for Jesus. And they want to do it, and I'm not going to hold them back. And neither are you. Bless God, y'all better start leading. They're going to lead y'all. They're going to take off and leave you behind if you ain't careful. And then y'all going to walk out and go, man, them young people, they always getting the benefit of everything. Blah, blah, blah. You know why? Because they're doing what God told them to do. No, well, that's exactly the reason. Go on, brother. That's exactly the reason why I see a lot of churches say, well, the young people are taking over church. Well, praise God. Yeah, amen. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Man. Because these dead bones, these dead bones got to walk somehow. That's yes, you know? <laughs> so Preach! <laughs> so, I mean, come on. And the, and the trip, but, you know, this is where this whole ambassador thing takes place. Yeah, man, come on. Is because if, listen to me. Oh, man. <laughs> Get off this, Jesus. Come on. <laughs> if you're not being an ambassador for Christ, yeah, come and on. you're out here and you and you act like you know God, all you're doing is teaching a false gospel. That's right. Amen. Now, I want you to hear that. Say it again, brother. Come on. Because that right there should convict us to the heart to where we can't leave here until we get this thing settled. That's good, man. Come on. Because if you're in this room and you're not obedient to God's commands and what he is telling you to do, and you are proclaiming, you are proclaiming in a sense, I know God, but you don't act like you know God and you don't live like you know God, then all you're doing is teaching a false gospel. And that is a deadly sin. Yes. Mm. Deadly sin. Mm. If you don't believe me, you look at all the people in Scripture who didn't, wasn't obedient to God, what did he do? <laughs> Some of them he struck dead. Yep. You know? Sorry about that. That's all right, man. Go ahead. I'm about to break Head up. Head up, baby. I'm good. And so that's, that, that, that's so important. Yeah. <laughs> that's so important for us to understand as, as ambassadors for Christ, we have been given a job. We have been given this duty. And if you're not, man, I, I, I you know, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's bad. And I, I tell you where I was convicted on this is because, and I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to say names, but um, Kim was coming and telling me, about this youth meeting, he said, man, you know, they're talking about this specific person and how they went down the front and they're praying and, you know, and how that was just this, you know, they wanted to do that and, and they, you know, and that, you know, whoever that person was, God knows who they are, yep. um, made a bigger impact in their lives than their own daddy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just, that's terrible. And what was really cool was the next week, you know, my son, he, I turn around, I look, my son's coming down the front, and I think he's asking me if he can go down the front. And I'm like, yeah, go on down the front. And I, later on, I said, my, uh, you know, Jonah, why did you ask me if you wanted to go down the front? He said, I wasn't asking. I was just going to go. I was just telling you I was going down. <laughs> <laughs> you go, boy. You go. Get the fire on the baby. That's all. And I was like, now, are you coming? Are you coming with me? I'm going down here to pray, but God. And I was, I was like, oh, uh, okay. Well, great. Good job. You're doing exactly what you're supposed oh, to do. Oh, that's awesome, man. We do not have, listen to me, we do not have to ask permission yeah, come to on. be obedient to what God's calling us to Right. About. Yeah, come on, man. man. That's right. I no longer, this is the problem with the, this is one of the problems yep. with, 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 the, with the, the big C church today, is that we feel like we have to ask permission. You know? Yep. yep. We have been given authority. That's right. Listen, this Talk about oh, it. goodness gracious. We have been given authority. Stand by up, baby. Go on, preach. <laughs> we have been given authority by God. Yes, sir. All right. To lead. Yes, sir. To rule. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you're not leading and you're not ruling, then you're being disobedient with God and you need to get yourself right with Jesus. Oh, today. Lord Jesus. You hear me? <laughs> Come on, man. That's right. Because, because of who he is, who, who is he? He is ruler. And because of what he did, he rules. We have been, we, who am I? Well, I now have been given authority to rule. Yep. So what do I do? You are the ruler. I yep. rule. Yes, sir. Come on, man. That's simple. Yep. Right? It's that simple. And so if, if I can't do that, if I can't be that ambassador, <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It's a gospel identity. A gospel identity. Listen, goodness man. Gracious. If y'all could grasp the gospel identity in your lives and help you change and understand and see it through the lens of who Jesus is, That's it. your life dramatically changes. For, I'm not saying it gets easy. Good right. Lord, it doesn't get easier. That's right. As a matter of fact, we will have tribulation. Yep. But your purpose becomes a whole lot clearer. Yeah, see, we talked about this yesterday, and, and I brought up this point. 
You, you spend, everybody in this room has spent at least 12 years in high school. All right? Now, you may have dropped out, but most of you spent at least 12 years in high school. All right? Then, if you went to college, you had another four years, depending on what you did, maybe six. All right? Uh, and then, if you go to a, a, a master's, that, that's another three to four years. And if you get your doctorate, then you got two more on top of that. All to become something in a career. How many of us spent any, anywhere near that much becoming a Christian? Now, I am all about education. But bless God, somebody needs to spend some time becoming the man's man, mm -hmm. man's woman. And we aren't doing that. We're not spending any time with our children training them up to be that. Yes. We're trying to make them ball players, make sure they got their degree so they can get a job somewhere, spend all the time in the books and all that kind of stuff. We'll make them study five hours a night for a class, but we won't make them read the Bible. Somebody better say amen. Well, Ken, if I make them read the Bible, bless God, make them read it and memorize it. Later on, it'll matter somewhere. Yeah, that's right. that's you right. see, right. our problem is we don't think we need to make them do anything. Bless God, make your children walk as unto the Lord. If they don't, swat them on the rear end and put them in the right direction. If they're living like hellions, take them out of the hell part and put them back on Jesus. That is your role as a parent. Grandparents, we talk about, well, I can spoil them and send them home. Bless God, you suck if you do that. <laughs> I ain't lying to you because they think they can get anything they want at Grandmama's house, and then they try to do it at home, little pagans, because you did it to them, big pagan. Come on, man. We need to get this stuff together. We have got to start training up children, training up our people, training up our leaders to walk after God. Failing to act is the same thing as not loving at all. Did y'all know that? You tell me you love somebody, but you don't do anything for them, you do not love them. You tell me you love somebody, but let them go to hell, you don't love them. You don't love them at all. You don't tell them they need Jesus, you don't have any love in you. We have to work because we are not working for us, but we're working on behalf of God. And they need love. Somebody say amen. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. You've been made. Somebody in call now. The eyes of all who look to you, you, you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. This is the heart of God. Listen, man. Matthew 21 talks about the boy whose dad walks up to him and says, I need you to do this for me. He says, okay, but he doesn't do it. He tells the other boy, I need you to do this for me. He says, I ain't going to do that. But then he does it. Which one's right? The one that did. So it's not about your words. It's about your duty. It's about what you do. I said duty. Y'all better watch out now. Come on. All right. This is the man. Shannon, what are some blessings that found impact in, by impacting the world? Man, what do we find? I, I think the one of the greatest blessings that we have is just being a part of God's big story. Yeah, man. Come on. That's um, good. I, I remember my, you know, <clears throat> even even now I feel like, you know, things that happen are, are, are my story. I'm, I make them happen. I want my story to be this way. And so I'm going to go this way, and I'm going to end up at a dead end. I'm going to feel terrible about it, and then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to try this story. And ultimately, you know, if we're just a part of God's big I, I was thinking about this, this, this parable. That, you know, it was a parable. It was a story that God made up. Yep. But this, this, these, these people that played in that parable were part of God's big story. Yeah. He, he, he was telling people, hey, listen, this is, this is this. This is that. This is what happens. And as an ambassador, as a Christian, as, as a follower of Christ, we have a great opportunity to be a part of God's big story. Another thing is, is we have the ability to change generation after generation after generation to come. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one thing we talked about in our men's group is, you know, your whole lives as, as, as men, our whole lives are dictated or defined by people in our lives. So if like my, my father helped define me who I was. And, and the problem was a lot of times that can be very polluted itself. And so, but what I don't know is, is understanding, as I pass that understanding of what it's like to be a man, 
down from generation and generation and generation to come until I realize who is the man, and that's right. Jesus, that's right. on, and that uh, because I'm a byproduct of him, then ultimately that's not how things are supposed to be. Yep. And so when I try to, when I discover what, who God is and what he's done for me, then I have the ability to change that, not just for my wife and my family, that's right. but also for my kids and their families right. and their kids and their families. And I mean, this is, like, you know, Abraham's a patriarch, right? Right. I mean, people still talk about him today. Yep. Why? Because of his obedience to God. Yep. And we have that ability to, to do that in, for future generations. So that's, that's a huge blessing. So God's big story, being a part of that, number one, and then having the ability to pass that story down from generation to generation. Yeah, that's good. Because if you'll, if you'll remember, we don't have any idea what the woman at the well's name was know she made an impact on that community. Mm. She met the man and went and told him, I think I found him. How many of y'all done that? I think I know him. I think I found him. Bless God, you've been looking. I got him for you. And then they'll say, oh, I don't believe because of what you said. I believe because I found him too, and I'm going to tell somebody else. That's how it ought to work. It's just, we don't even know the name, but we know they're there. When they get to heaven, I can't wait to find that woman. Yeah. I mean, because get, listen, I'm like her. When Jesus looked at me, he showed me all my stuff, too. I, I was, uh, okay, what do you do with that? You know, this is amazing. The woman who had the, the issue of blood, we don't have any idea who she was. But bless God, we're going to meet her one day. When we get to heaven, she's going to be there. You see, all those people are part of that big story. Absolutely. All right, now, there, I think that one of the things we need to look at is this, real quick. We, we're almost done. What are some, th some ways to become sensitive to the heart of God? Now, I'm talking about how do we find that heart in us? What do you think? Well, I think number one is we have to embrace God. And I, I, was, I wrote this down before we started talking about what we were looking at. And um, in Mark 3, 13 through 14, he says this. It's not going to be on the screen, so you just listen. Jesus went up to uh, the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, to send them out to preach and to have authority and to drive out demons. When we read that verse, our mind focuses on uh, the to preach and drive out demons. Right. Okay, but what we miss is this little, you know, four little thing that says to be with Him. Yeah. And so we to be sensitive to what God is wanting us to do. We have to. I can't say this. Enough, we have to be with Him. Yeah. And if there's something in your life right now that's keeping you from being with Him, yeah, then good. you need to jack that thing out of there. That's it, man. That's okay. It. I don't know what that is. I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, we can, we can sit here and we can throw darts all day long about what those things are, but you, only you have the ability and the power to say, you know what, if I'm going to focus and have some type of proximity with God, then I need to make sure that my distractions are out of the way. Yeah, so, and, that, and ultimately what am I doing? I'm, I'm trying to have the heart for what God's yeah, heart is. That's right. And another thing, too, is I, in doing so, uh, the things that break God's heart is going to also break mine. Because I'm going to see what he's sensitive to. I want to, I want to understand where I'm, the environment and the places and the people that I'm around. I'm going to feel and say, you know, as somebody said, you know, I have a lot. I have this gift of discernment. I'm able to. I have this sense. I can feel things. That's that right there. If you're with God, then you don't have to sit back. Well, maybe it's just me. No, that's God. That's right. That's right. Because it's impossible to, right. sit on, to be to be so much with Him and not think and act and and be like. And so, uh, and then I think another one is, you know, in that same context is just prayer. Yeah. It, it's just get in the word and read God's word, let him speak to you through his word, and then you speak back to him in prayer. And this is a two-way conversation that um, ultimately happens. Because here's the thing, if I, if, I take God's, if I take God's word, right, and I take whatever it is that I'm struggling with and I filter it through God's word, whatever comes out in the end, I need to focus on. That's right. That's good. Okay, I need, I, need, I, need to, I need to look at. Because a lot of things are going to be answered inside here. But ultimately, there's going to come things in my life where I go, all right, I need to deal with it. That's right. And here's how, here's how I deal with it. Yep. And so I think that's where you're going to be, that's how you're going to be sensitive. That's awesome. Yeah, and, 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 and it's important to realize that being sensitive to God is, is not going to be easy. You're going to have to work at it. Um, and you're going to have to open your mind. I think being sensitive to God also, another thing is to look around you and, and ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? You can't know what Jesus would do if you're not in the Word and know what he did. So you've got to know that, okay? 
But what, what if, if I see something and I'm looking at it, how would Jesus minister in that moment? You know, what would he do with somebody that's poor? What would he do with somebody who's hurt? What would he do with somebody who's broken right now? What would he do with that? If he's going to do that, then I need to do that because I'm an ambassador representing him. Oh, that's really good. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close this up, just, but I, I, before we close up in, in the altar, I want to share this with you. Here's your focus for the week. Are y'all ready? <laughs> I want you to focus on where you work or where you go to school. I want you to look at where you work or where you go to school and ask some questions. What can I do to minister to people where I'm at? Because he's right. The people you have where you are, and that, the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up, most of you spend at least seven to eight hours in those places. Okay? Seven to eight hours is a long time to be around people. And you've got a lot you can do on the good side if you do it. For example, um, I'm, I'm just throwing some ideas out here for you. You can write these down if you want, whatever. But I think some of y'all need to, to go buy some Dunkin' Donuts, uh, or buy some Krispy Kreme, take them into the staff break room, leave them, leave a note on there. God bless you guys. I love you. They'll ask, who did that? Well, I did, but I just wanted y'all to know I love you today. God bless you is already God. But when they hear you say, I love you, that action just showed it. And it doesn't cost a lot to put a couple of boxes of donuts in there, okay? And you're not buying it, it's expensive. Donut life's a little more expensive, don't they? <laughs> I got one. Go ahead. Uh, we saw it this week, I'll see the class this morning. Go ahead. Is, uh, how many, some of y'all have kids go to school. Yep. Uh, right now, during this time of season, it's recess. Yep. And I just read in this past week that how uh, there were some families who were going in and giving their kids book fair money, but they were giving just a little bit extra and saying, hey, if there's a kid who doesn't have the money to buy a book, man, buy a book. There you go, kids. Man, take some extra money in. Give them $4 extra, man. They can buy a couple of books for that and give them to another kid that doesn't have any money. And there are kids in school that don't get books because they don't have money. Somebody, hey, listen, develop a new friendship with somebody in there. You know them as an acquaintance. Make them a friend. I cannot reiterate how important it is for you to create friendships you don't have. And you do not know what kind of blessing will come out of that. And, they, and listen, they may not be like you, but they can be. Think about that. They could be like, that's exactly right, a disciple. Another thing is, invite someone to church. Give them, at work, man, they're going through something. Let, come to church and let God bless you for a little while. Sit with me and let's just, I'll pray with you. Let's, but come to church and let God do something. That's not a big deal. But invite somebody. Another thing is prayer walk the halls where you're at. Get there early. Get there, listen, man, get there 20 minutes, 30 minutes early. Walk up and down the halls of where you work. Pray over the rooms and ask God to speak into these people. Begin to open their eyes to his reality. Pray for them to be blessed by the Lord because many of them need it right now. Lay hands on the doors of the offices and pray God over them. Rebuke Satan in those rooms because you don't know what's going on behind those rooms, who they're having to talk to, what they're dealing with, divorce and all that other stuff. Their kids may be going through all kinds. You don't know, but rebuke Satan on their lives. Do it before they get there. That way you're not, and if they walk in and they ask what you're doing, I'm just praying for you guys before we start today. I don't know anybody that's ever caught me praying for them. Look at me and go, don't do that. And that no, no, and they're going, praise God, that's awesome, man, you know. Well, thank you so much for thinking about it, all right? Walk your prayer off. At school, it's a little bit different, man. As you're walking down, pray over the rooms. Get there a little bit early, pray over the rooms. Y'all already getting up early anyway. Man, y'all getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning anyway. It ain't going to matter. Go get there another 20 minutes early and just pray over the rooms as you're walking down the hall. Pray for your teacher. Speak their name. Don't walk by and say the woman with the glasses. Find out what her name is. <laughs> and speak it. That guy I don't like, God help him. You know, come on. But pray over your teachers, man. Can I help you here? They're working with a bunch of crazy youngins. They need the youngins to pray over them. Pray over them, okay? Another thing is, pass out candy to people you see. You just had Halloween. Can I check you help y'all here? Everything's on sale. Go buy a bunch of it. Don't buy the crap candy. Buy the Snickers, all right? Give them a candy bar. Same thing I was thinking about today. If they're diabetic, give them something that doesn't have any sugar in it. But pass out some candy. Smile at people. You know what? I wish some of y'all would smile. Because if you'll smile, you'll change the whole attitude around the way people look. People that come in and they're that grumpy, uh, you know, I think you gotta give them coffee first. Smile at them anyway. You know? Make them wonder what you're thinking. 
Eric thought he got that one down. All right, <laughs> All right. and, and put another one. You look for help ways. You know your people. You know where you work. You know what you're doing. You know your school. We look for ways to help people. If you find out something's going on, be, be aware of your employ the people that are employed with you. When was the last time you walked in and told your boss, I, I really appreciate you giving me this job? You see, y'all think, well, I work for them. They should pay me. Can I help y'all here? They don't have to hire you. They can hire somebody else. And there are 10 other people that want your job right now. Walk in there. You think, my job sucks. Can I help you here? You got a job. Thank God for it and do your job. I, I want to, I'm going to say this out loud. You have no right to tell people that hire you what you want to do. You have the responsi responsibility to do what they tell you for the money they're paying you. And if you don't like your job, go get another one. But don't complain about the one you're in. Because I'm going to tell you all something, boys and girls. Let me help you all here, man. There was, well, there was a day when I needed a job and couldn't find it for a little while. And I blessed and praised God when I finally found one that I could support my family with. So you make sure that you understand that you are not here to make the money the way you want to. We talked about this during the men's thing. Your job is based on sin. You're sweating by your brow because of, of sin. That's why you're having to work. So if you're going to work, make the best of it. Somebody say amen now. Come on, man. Now here, here's what I'm going to close with. Because I, I just I got to do this before we go anywhere. I'm going to say this out loud to everybody. Okay? You cannot in any way, shape, or form Find the heart of God and embrace it unless yours has been regenerated and changed by Jesus Christ through salvation. If you do not know the Lord, you cannot have God's heart. You, you don't even know what love is until you know Jesus. Because God is love. And if you don't have God in you, there's no love in you. There is a form, but there is not true love. So, if you're here today and you need to accept Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to tell you this. Run to the altar and we have it. Do not be embarrassed. Do not worry about what other people think. Do not, I don't even care what somebody sent me you think. Because until you get your heart right and get saved, know Jesus is your personal Savior. Listen, man, one thing, you're going to hell. You don't need to do that. The other thing is you can't be used by God. And he wants to use you. The other thing is you will never know the blessings of God until you find him. So don't you sit out there going, well, I'm just not sure. Move your tail to the altar. We will pray with you and lead you to the throne. And we will take you to Jesus. When you walk out of here, you'll be a new person created in his image. All right? The other thing is this. Some of you need the heart of God desperately. Because you've got an attitude this big. And you need to lose attitude. All right? Some of you, listen, man, you need the heart of desperately because you don't care about people at all. It's all about you and yours, and God never made you that way. If he came into your heart, it is not that way anymore. Some of us need to realize that we're just missing an opportunity that's right in front of us, and we need to ask God to show us, open our eyes and show us. We need to get down here and go, Lord, until you open my eyes, I'm not going to get up. I want to be able to see around me the way you see, and it's going to hurt you when you start getting the burden that God has for people. But it's worth it. I don't mind crying anymore. There was a day that I don't mind it anymore. I can cry right now. Because when I think about what our sin did to the world, I can't stand it. I can't stand what sin's doing to you. I mean, y'all don't know how much I pray for you because I know how burdened some of you are. And I want you to understand, until you get those things in line, you'll never have the heart of God. You can't embrace God's heart until that stuff is taken care of. So as we have the, uh, the call today, as the band's playing whatever, and I'm inviting the band to do it too. If they don't need to play, if they need to be on their faces, they get out here and play. I don't have to have a count on the bass and the drum and all that. I don't have to have that. I would rather have you on your face telling God you need him. That's where worship happens. This is just a form of it. I want real worship. So if you don't need to play, don't get down here and pray. But the altar is open today for us to find the Lord and let him create in us a heartbeat 
that when somebody walks by, we get excited because we know God wants to do something in them. So I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet and let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, in this house, I pray right now. And I ask you, Lord, to fill this place up with your heart. To break ours and to mold it in your image. I pray, God, right now, that if there's one person in this room that does not know you, that, God, they will not sit at that chair anymore. They'll come down here and ask you to come into their lives. Create in them the new creature they're supposed to be and show them the glory of the Lord. And I pray, Father God, that we would embrace who you are and how you feel and how you see this world. Lord, break our hearts and minds that we may weep for those out here who hurt. And God, this week, I pray, God, you give us opportunity upon opportunity to touch the lives of people and show them Jesus in every way, shape, and We love you for what you're going to do, for who you are. And I pray, God, right now that you would just begin to move on us. Nobody's looking around. Every head bowed. Nobody's looking around. They're going to start singing here in a minute. You come. You come now. If you need to come now, get on down here and pray. But let's not wait on the Lord. Let's go to the Lord and find him. Somebody say amen. amen. Seek the Lord where he may be found. Don't wait on anybody else. You move now and come on down. Because when they start singing, I'm going to start praying over the ones down here. Christy and all of them are going to jump down here and pray with me. We're going to start praying on people. Young people, y'all got this. We got this, man. We're going to do something great for the Lord, man. But you come. Don't you wait. Zach, go ahead and sing something, brother. Let's do this. Y'all come on down now. Don't you wait. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Do what God tells you to do. Don't you wait. Come.